I emptied my bank account on personal development seminars and programs and workshops mm. over and over and over again to show the universe, this is what I value. This is what's important to me. And then she started rewarding my spiritual pursuits mm. with financial return and saying like, yeah, mm -hmm. your spiritual growth, you're right. It is worthwhile and I'm going to pay you for it. And I'm like, hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Oh, so good. We're back, baby, with a brand new season of the It's Fucking Spiritual podcast. Join us each week as we have unfiltered conversations about how to transform your life. Our mission is to usher in a new era of spirituality where you don't have to be all love and light to live a life of alignment. Here, we honor all of it, the profound and the profane, the magic and the messy, and all things that make you human. So let's discuss the truth behind transformation and be unapologetic in our evolution. From manifestation to money, embodiment to energy, and all taboo topics, nothing is going to be off limits. Are you ready to live a life that feels just as good as it looks? Let's get fucking spiritual. Welcome back to the It's Fucking Spiritual podcast. You guys, I am so excited for today's episode. We have a guest that we've never had on the show before, <laughs> and she is amazing. We have some mutual friends, and I've heard incredible things about her. And as I was doing my research for this show, <laughs> I was just like so lit up and so aligned by the permission that she gives mm. to claim who you are. And she is an incredible speaker, coach, author, creator, and a self-proclaimed witch. So Mia Magic, welcome yes, to the show. Thank you. <laughs> so happy to be here. I am so excited to have you. And I love how much you just have reclaimed the identity of witch and um, how aligned I feel with just the way you be in the world. And... I would imagine people listening to this probably have all these different preconceived notions of what is that? What does that mean? And so I want to just start there. Like, what does witch mean to you? And also tell us a little bit about the journey of becoming who you are now. For me, being a witch is really about living in alignment with the lessons that you've learned in your life. The word means wise. So it's about wisdom. The difference between knowledge and wisdom is how it's integrated and mm -hmm. how we walk forward informed by it. So for me, I've learned that Mother Nature is the greatest teacher and the greatest lover and the most unbelievably infinite energetic resource, right? We like rape and pillage and plunder her for all of these physical resources. And yet when you connect with her from a state of abundance and gratitude and appreciation, she is this living sentient deity and can provide you with answers to any question, any query, any challenge, and will help heal you. And she helped heal me. And so being a witch for me is living in service to and alignment with nature, being aware of the fact that there is this magical world all around us if we choose to see it, and doing your own interpersonal transfiguration and alchemy in order to then be of deeper service to the healing and the awakening, and I hope ultimately the harmony of humanity. Mm, so good. <laughs> so beautiful and so true um, in ushering in this new wave and new reality. And that's something that I so stand for here on yeah. this podcast as well. And, yeah. and so tell us a little bit about your journey into transforming and claiming your witchiness. What did that look like? Was there a time when <laughs> you didn't? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, like everybody, mm -hmm. I have a lot of Christian friends. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of moments in my life and in my journey to becoming a witch, to claiming the word really yeah. specifically, where people would say, but why? Like, don't call yourself that. It's evil. You're bad. And so because I didn't have religious uh, uh, programming and upbringing, I was raised by hippies. I didn't understand why does everyone think it's bad? Why does everyone think it's evil? What? I was programmed too, of course, more by the media and, and film and, and sort of just this overarching societal projection of what a witch means, but I didn't understand why people were afraid. Mm. And so I started really researching and, and looking into the history and the witch trials and how the church made witches bad when really ultimately back then, witches were the doctors. 
They were the healers. They were the ones that you would rely upon. They were the ones who knew how to work with the moon and the energies and the cycles of seasons in order to make their plants grow. And one of the really beautiful factoids around black cats and witches is that during the Black Plague in Europe, which was a very powerful, obviously like a sort of like the church was really just coming into a whole new level of absolute rule during like the 15, 1600s. That's when the printing press was invented. And during the Black Plague, often witches wouldn't die of the plague or they wouldn't even get sick. And so they were villainized. And when you really look at what was happening, people were saying that cats were spreading the plague, but it was rodents. We know now that it was the pests and the, and the rats and the mice that were traveling, you know, in the sewers and through people's houses. So they were killing the thing that actually kills the plague. They were killing the cats. They were villainizing the cats and wiping out thousands and thousands of cats were killed during this time also. And witches often kept cats. So like, you don't have mice and rats if you have a cat because it is going to take care of those things. And so there's just all these little wild pieces of, oh, witches were blamed for the plague. Cats were being blamed for the plague. It's really the rodents and we killed the exact thing that was would have been helping us. And it's very much just the way that the church did things. It's like, mm. oh, would you like to, you know, come and join my religion? okay, no, oh, well, I'm going to kill you then. And yeah. I'm going to wipe out your whole family. Yeah. And that's not really an inviting way to uh, give someone a relationship to worship and to the mm. divine. And so there was just all these underhanded things that had been brushed under the rug historically that were so enlightening to me. I was like, oh, wait, we've just been told that they're scary. We've just been taught that the people who were the ones supporting us and healing us and and helping us on our path, like the councils, the wise elders, the way that every tradition, every lineage has these wise women, medicine women, men, people who were the the shamans, the the guides for the tribe. Those people were villainized because they were empowered, because they were sovereign, because they didn't need anyone else. And the church really went in and created all of these like tithings and how much you need us and prayer is your only way of healing rather than working with the plants, which was how our medicine existed for thousands of years. And so for me, it was about research. It was about understanding how we got here. And then ultimately, it was really just this. I feel like this hat is kind of like the sorting hat in Hogwarts, you know, uh, in Harry Potter. I It chose me. Mm. It was like I I need someone to wear this hat and bring home this archetype that is not evil. It's not scary. It's actually of a healer and as a wise person who's here to guide and here to support and here to empower others. And I need someone to remember that and reawaken it within others. And and she chose me. I have like full chills mm -hmm. just saying it. And it's just become so abundantly clear and it was hard. And there are a lot of people who, it's funny because I I actually came up against more backlash from people that I knew personally yeah. than in my audience or than online. Mm -hmm. I get the odd Bible verse on my YouTube videos. Like, I hope Jesus helps you. And I'm like, yeah. cool, thanks. Like, I love Jesus. I'm yeah. here for the archetype. <laughs> like, it's the people who speak on his behalf that I'm like, hard no, you know? <laughs> and um, And so, yeah, it was really interesting that the way that, people perceived this hat or me wearing it was so kind and so welcoming and so appreciative. And I, I believe that that's because we all know that magic is in our history. And we all remember a time where there was a wise counselor, an elder who would support us and guide us towards our own relationship to the divine, yeah. guide us to what God looks and feels and smells and tastes like inside of our bodies and with our relationship to the world around us and, and nature itself, which is how we all lived uh, up until the Industrial Revolution. And so it's been a long journey, but for me, it's really just, it's about serving what I feel like the goddess needs and what our planet desperately needs. And so if I can be 
a sweet face and like an accessible little digestible girl to wear this iconic symbol of evil over the last mm-hmm. couple thousand years, then so be it. Like, <laughs> let's fucking go. I'm here for it. I love that yeah. so much. It's fucking spiritual. It's fucking spiritual. <laughs> it's yeah. So like fucking spiritual. everything is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. And you touched on so many points that I could just take and go down a rabbit hole. And, and one thread that I'm noticing mm. through what you're sharing and and also what I've noticed in my my own life and becoming in society as a whole is this weaponization of what actually brings us into our own power, right? And what keeps us separate from the divinity that exists within us. And the piece around, um, and what I love that you stand for is finding the divine in yourself and yeah. understanding that there's magic in and around all of us at all times. Yes. And you always have access to it. And it's not through, you don't reach salvation through the church or through this um, specific, like, you have to go through this person or yeah. this um, path, path or practice. Path, right, yeah. right. It, it's it's always available and it's always open and it's always there. And and society and the way our culture has been formed over hundreds, maybe thousands of years has taken us away from um, the true nature that is really us. And I believe that that's by design to keep us out of our power. And so I just love the reclamation that you have in this. And and for somebody that maybe is beginning to walk their path yeah. and is like, but what do you mean? This is new for them, right? Yeah. And and maybe they don't understand connecting to the divinity within themselves. Where would you say to start? What can you give them and gift them? Yeah, well, that's the great thing. From my perspective about being a witch, I, I teach witchcraft very differently than everyone else does. Mm-hmm. I'm not telling people to like do specific spells on specific days, wearing specific robes and and saying specific things. I don't prescribe anything because I do think that that's part of the problem. And so my invitation is always to find your own path. When you look at climbing a mountain, snakes slither, eagles fly, mountain goats scale the cliffs, humans take a path. Everybody's going to get up the mountain their own way. Mm -hmm. And so One, it's about finding what you love. I always invite people to reconnect with their inner child. What were you in? Like, this is just who I was. My life is just in service to like my seven-year-old self. (laughs) She was just wildly fantastical, obsessed with magic, like in all the books, had a black cat that she could talk to, like in all of these fairy tales. And, And so I'm honoring what I wanted before someone told me I couldn't have it or I wasn't worthy of it or it was stupid. So that's number one. Number two is remembering that literally our bodies like this is the earth. Your physical body is the earth. The bones within you are like the stones in the mountains. Then you have rivers and creeks and streams of blood flowing through your veins in every moment. We breathe in air that we exchange with the natural world. Literally plants and algae are making the air for us that we breathe. And so we're intrinsically connected to this world around us. And then the fire, there's electricity making your heart beat all the time, making all of your digestive processes occur, transferring hormones and all the little things happening inside of our body. It's an electrical system. So we're made of these same four elements as the entire universe is built upon. And then there is the fifth sacred thing, which is the spirit. And that is what animates us all. Even that word anima comes from spirit in Latin. And so to be animated is to have the spirit inside of you. And spirit, spirare, comes from breath or to breathe life into. Like We are intrinsically linked to the elements. And so that's something that I really invite people into is figure out how you can utilize the elements in your own life. The earth is like your physical environment, your home, your career, your finances, your relationships, your health, your actual body. The water is your emotions, your creativity, your sexuality. The air is your communication, your expression, how you think, your belief systems. The fire is your action, your transformation, your capacity to uh, move forward. It's your ambition and drive and will. And so really looking at where which element in your life maybe has the, the least power, with what needs the most support. And how can you use connection to the sun or a deep, like you were talking about, just laying in the grass and and being in the meadow, as we were mentioning before, just just like laying on the earth or 
you know, working with the waters, whether praying or bathing rituals or just spending time next to lakes and rivers and creeks and streams, there's blue and green space are types of brain matter that are created just by being in green environments where like your entire surroundings, everything you see is is green and is of nature or just calm water. It doesn't have to be calm, but like sitting by water. Mm. The longer and more you do it, the more you generate this deeply healthy, proactive brain matter. It's mm. so magical. And so for me, those are the those are the really easy ways that you can get into witchcraft, meditation, any type of spirituality just by relating to the elements because the elements are always present. They are these infinite sources of power that you can connect to at all times and then work through and see, oh, I'm having an emotional challenge. Okay, well, what would it look like for me to work with the water? How can I cleanse or purify myself? Do I need to cry some tears? Do I need to have more orgasms, right? Like, mm. what can I do to work with this element to empower whatever the thing is that feels like it's lacking in my life? And that's a really great, easy way to, one, generate your own personal, individual spirituality because you just listen to your intuition, as I like to call mm. it, which is also the name of my book. or you can really allow it to then communicate through you and to you and invite you into a deeper practice or a ritual that, again, like you make your own path up the mountain. You don't need anyone to tell you. Because anytime anyone tells me like, oh, this way is the only way or this is the fastest way, I'm like, well, then it's probably not the way for me. Yeah, I'm going to carve my own path and mm. I'll blaze my own trail and I'm going to get some fire in my face, but this is the way that I want to do it. And I think that that's the most impactful way for all of us. Oh. So good. So good. <laughs> mic, mic drop already. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Um, so beautiful. And and I'm hearing just like as above, so below. This as within, so without. Everything that exists, it's the microcosm and the macrocosm and our entire body and our entire being is the whole universe. And when we are able to really feel into we are all of creation and yeah. we are all of it. And can we connect into our spine and into our source and into our radiance and and gosh yeah just connecting with the elements that's been a big thing in my life over the past year yeah. so I love that you're you're bringing that and and uh something I've heard you talk about that I want to touch on um because the last time I touched on this it went viral and I got a lot of hate so this is oh perfect. great <laughs> like are we perfect. I have a feeling where we're going uh, okay great yeah. yeah um and that is um you said your your body and it's the earth and it's also the safety, the security, the abundance, right? And the abundance that we have on the planet and the idea of money and spirituality. And I've heard you talk about this a bit when I was doing some research and I'm such a stand for uh, spiritual people and, and, and people that are really working on coming into higher consciousness with themselves and also bringing that up in the planet, needing to have resources and money and why that is so spiritual. And I've gotten some so hate strange. on that. Huh. And so I would love to chat a little bit more about that and hear your thoughts on it. Uh, I fucking love money. <laughs> I love it. I love money so much. Uh, um, yeah, because it's just an energy. It's just a flow. It's an expression of abundance. Now, the way that money has been wielded against us in our society, again, as we touched on before, about power. Like, when you look at even the school system, the education system was made for factories. It was made to create good, obedient, normal. They were originally called normal schools or common schools to create normal people who would just basically be enslaved. So, We've been taught, we've been programmed to consume. Like, look at the way that people just buy things on Amazon. Like, I'm an anti-Amazon person. I don't buy from Amazon. I don't support Amazon. Jeff Bezos doesn't need any more money, but like small artisans and craftspeople and farmers, like they need my money. And so that's a great place. I think one of the important things to look at is like, how are you, if you have challenges with money, if you think that money is bad, how are you perpetuating that? in your own reality. Because if you're using your money, if you're voting with your dollars to 
continue these cycles of disempowerment of other people and continuing to make the rich richer, then like, yeah, of course, money's going to feel shitty to you. Mm -hmm. I feel great about money because I work my money in a way that feels so empowered to me. My entire home is furnished secondhand. All my restoration hardware couches I got like at Facebook market or on Facebook marketplace or, you know, on offer up or these like little apps where like I get these genuine things that there already exist on the planet. I don't need to make any more stuff. So that's a, a huge way that I, you know, some people think like, oh, vintage, like secondhand, like that's scarcity. I'm like, no, it feels like the ultimate abundance to me because I'm mm. not hurting the earth in any way. I'm I'm utilizing things that are already here and I'm blessing her and I feel her blessing me in return. And there's a couple of things about money. Again, one, it's just energy. So if you want to live an abundant life and you're poo-pooing or like disdaining a particular type of energy that exists as one expression of abundance in our reality, then like good luck accessing abundance. Because if you're shitting on abundance, then it's going to be like, okay, well, bye. You know, like, I don't want to hang out with you. If you're like talking badly about it and saying how money makes people bad or wrong or are selfish, then money's going to be like, okay, well, then I guess you don't want to hang out. So I'll just stay over here with someone else. A couple of things are, someone once told me that it is the duty and obligation of people with money to awaken spiritually in order for the world to change. Mm -hmm. And it is the duty and obligation of spiritual people to have money mm, in chills. order to influence the world changing. So when you look at people like us, back in the day, a priestess, again, a wise woman, the healer, would be taken care of by the village. People would bring you eggs and chickens and loaves of bread. And, you know, you would either live in a hut that someone built for you or like the temple that was where everyone would come to worship, you know, you would be provided for because of your service mm -hmm. to the earth, because of your gifts and offerings to your tribe, to your community. So that's one thing. It doesn't work like that anymore. The only way that my tribe and community can support me continuing to give my gifts and live my life is by paying me to do it because I got to pay rent and, or, you know, a mortgage and my car and gas. And like, I had to fly here to be able to sit in person and do th this with you. Like, thank God is for money. Thank mm. God. Like money takes care of me. I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful for money. I love it. And that kind of energy makes it want to come to you more. Mm. And when you are choosing, you know, we were talking about this with food last night. Someone was saying, oh, I don't like venture out to the farmer's market. You know, like, I go to the farmer's market every week. It's part of my ritual. I know my farmers. I know the people who are growing my food. I know that these guys are biodynamic. And this guy doesn't use pesticides, but he's very uh, concerned with the regeneration of his soil. And he really like works with uh, the way that he moves his cows and goats and ducks around his fields. And so I trust that, you know, and there's this energy that we've lost of connecting to the true nature of abundance, which is nature. We abundance now is like bigger home, more stuff, but nature isn't like that. She's always digesting and alchemizing and like that which falls away, it, it decays and it becomes the food and the fuel for what comes next. So we've really separated ourselves and our entire society is operating on scarcity, but we have to have money in order to be giving our gifts. And I personally just like, I feel so good about having money and having built a business to where I have because what else is going to change the world? Yeah. If people like us who are spiritual are stuck in scarcity, it's going to be really hard to change and transform the systems that are ruling our planet, the governing bodies. Like I'm going to Davos, which is the World Economic Forum in January, which like people are like, what are what is someone like you doing there? And I'm like, I'm going to offer spiritual events so that just maybe I might awaken one, you know, trillionaire or whatever who could snap their fingers and instantaneously transform, you know, world hunger or the food system. Like there are enough people on the planet if we think about the amount of money that exists. If those people with money would just choose to reforest the coast of California, or change the agricultural system, or, you know, create wells in Africa, or s more schools for women in, in third world countries, because there's so much proof and evidence that when women are educated, societies are healthier. Mm. 
And there are people that could just change the world in an instant. And so if we're the people who want to change the world, if spiritual people are the ones who want to make an impact and want things to shift and want to live a magical life, which I certainly do. I want to transform my inner Voldemort. I don't want to be taking anything from anyone. I want to live in harmony with other people. And I want people who can give their gifts to me to also receive mine in return. And I believe wholeheartedly it is possible to operate in a close to utopian society. Everybody's still going to get triggered. We're still going to have bullshit. We're still going to have like conflict and things that we got to work through. But if we all work through that conflict with awareness and take responsibility, I know that the world can change and it is going to be up to fucking spiritual people yeah. to gain money and influence because the people that have money and influence right now, most of them are dead asleep and they are in so much pain and agony and there is no amount of money that can heal your suffering yeah. and heal your internal misery. And so by generating joy and happiness and an abundance of aliveness and vibrance and high vibration emotions, I am aligning with the frequency of abundance and then I am rewarded with money and then I work with that money in order to make choices that I feel are the kind of abundance that I want to see and experience in this mm -hmm. world. So I feel fucking great about money. I love <laughs> making money and I also trust my gifts. And yeah. I think that's one like small piece to, to say is that when you've worked on yourself enough to know that what you have to say and who you be, like you said, like the permission that you give to people is valuable. My mantra to get where I am today was, I just want to get paid to be myself. Yeah. I just want to get paid to be myself. I just want to make money from being who the fuck I am. And I want it to impact people and touch them deeply. And now it does. And so I feel so worthy of the abundance that I receive in my life. I know I deserve it because I fucking worked hard for it. And I, I had no money and I was totally broke and I was miserable. And even when I had no money, I still voted with my dollars for my own growth. Mm. I emptied my bank account on personal development seminars and programs and workshops mm. over and over and over again to show the universe, this is what I value. This is what's important to me. And then she started rewarding my spiritual pursuits mm -hmm. with financial return and saying like, yeah, mm -hmm. your spiritual growth, you're right. It yeah. is worthwhile and I'm going to pay you for it. And I'm like, hallelujah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah. And same, same. That is exactly how I transform my life as well. And, yeah. and what I'm hearing you say in this is just on mm – -hmm. On a collective level, yeah. we need the shift of wealth. And I, I truly believe that that is happening in the awakening of the planet yeah. right now, which is so beautiful and exciting to be a part of and yeah. be a part of this conversation and help usher this in. But on a individual level, someone listening to this, it's like where they can start is being a steward yeah. of the energy that you already have yep. now and where are you putting it. And what, like you said, voting with your dollars and where um, – and and I want to touch on the piece around uh, kind of the becoming mm. of the trusting of the self because I think a lot of people get kind of stuck there. There's that um, element of becoming a, a steward for for your money and the decision that you have around how you're going to use the energy that you have, which was so transformational in my life with when you back that with intention. But the other piece that I think a lot of people do get stuck on is the self-doubt yeah. and the comparison and thinking what they have isn't good enough. And I know I certainly have battled that in my own life. And, and even now I'm still learning to overcome and be in my, my truth and know my gifts are so worthy and valuable. And it sounds like maybe you went through a transformation in that way as well. What would you say to people that are – they have this hunger. They can feel it but it feels like there's a glass wall and you know everything that they want is on the other side but like how do i come into my own self trust and know that what i have to offer is valuable how would you begin healing that so the best way and you you know you mentioned the as above so below mm -hmm. and that is what my entire book explores is mm -hmm. the law of correspondence mm -hmm. everybody knows about the law of tra attraction but not everybody knows about the law of correspondence and from my perspective, it's working on the wall itself. Mm -hmm. It's not about where you're going, it's about the belief. Yeah. It's about the doubt. So yes, like I had so much doubt. I had so much scarcity, I had so much unworthiness. I had so many moments where I 
would, you know, choose not to do something because it cost money. And the belief that there won't be enough or whatever the bad thing is that you perceive will happen if you do the thing, right? Doubt comes from, well, if I try this, it won't work or I'll be rejected or I'll be abandoned. And and safety is such a primal need within ourselves. If you got cast out from the tribe, if you were rejected or abandoned, yeah, it was going to be hard to survive. Like maybe a lion was going to come and eat you. So that's a primal need that we have, but you can work on creating that safety within yourself. And it's hard. Like we were talking about how really deeply sometimes you have to go in and somatically transform yourself. But what I always teach people is, okay, you know, you can think about it from the lens of a spell. People are like, oh, I'm going to cast a spell and then I'm going to get this thing. But if I cast the spell and I don't get the thing, then like what happened? And I'm like, what's the story you tell yourself about that outcome or that result not coming? Is it that I'm unworthy? Is it that like the universe is punishing me or like hates me or whatever? Because if you work on whatever the doubt program and story is, that's going to be the thing that then like there is no glass wall. It just disappears and it Mm. sort of dematerializes from reality. And I've had so many money miracles where it required me to have the utmost faith And when you have that faith, the vibration around you changes because the vibration of faith and trust is one of abundance because it's just implying that like if I take a leap, the net will appear and I'm good and nothing can stop me. So what I really invite people to look at is, okay, if I'm if I'm worried or I'm not trusting money and my favorite book for money is Busting Loose from the Money Game, don't Mm. judge the book by its cover. It's the worst cover of all time. It's the best book written about money, I think. (laughs) And we have these stories of if I spend this here, then this doesn't exist or I can't go and do this thing. That's not true. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So like that energy is still going to be present there. You're just shifting and changing its form. So really looking at what is the belief that I have. If I'm in scarcity and, you know, right now it's a hard time for everybody. I I can't imagine how I would even be surviving if I was in the financial state that I was several years ago. Right now, with the way people are being priced out of buying ha- uh, healthy food and like how much gas costs and all of the things. So one, I have compassion because I was scraping by for so many years that I can't imagine how much it would take to just scrape by right now. Mm-hmm. It's It's really hard. And We are all creating our experience through the lens of our belief systems and through how our subconscious has been programmed to experience and reflect reality. And so if you have a desire, you want to go to some retreat or you want to do or you just want to feed your children healthy food, you saying yes to it and doing it anyways, even if there's fear, even if there's doubt, even if like your account gets overdrawn and making that choice, you're operating in a state of abundance. You're operating in a state of faith. And so that was a big practice for me was, would I say no to this if it wasn't about money? Mm -hmm. And the answer was always no. Like I would say yes. And so saying yes to all the things that are aligned. Again, this is not like going out and buying yourself like outrageously fancy shoes or like dresses in order to feel pretty or worthy or enough. It's like, what is the truth of abundance for me? And I speak to that because I had a horrible shopping addiction when Mm. I was young and I just like tried to fill the void of my own internal emptiness uh, with clothes and it didn't work. But if it's a choice that you know is going to help you advance, help you move forward, and you have doubt, and it's just about the money, look at that program. Again, go back to your inner child. Where was the first time you experienced this? Who proved this to you? How have you seen this belief play out in your life throughout it? And what could you do? Again, we were talking about using somatic therapies. How can you find it in your body? Like, can you dance it? Can you sound it out? Can you breathe into it? Can you like let that sticky, icky, like stuck belief that's holding you back? Can you work with it. What about just looking at it? Just seeing it as a hurt or wounded child, the way that you would respond to someone who's in pain. Hey, what do you need? 
Oh, I need, I need trust. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, how can you experience trust right now? What would it take for you to experience trust? Well, I need this. I need you to go out here. Sometimes it's random things like I need to walk every day or Mm. I need to dance or I need to have a conversation with someone that I've never had. Maybe the person that you received these negative beliefs from. Okay. Thank you so much. Like, Let's either envision us taking a walk right now or have that pretend conversation here in my mind or, you know what, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to call this person that you need me to call. And then you show that part of yourself, that wounding or that disbelief, you show it that it can trust you. And you're operating in that energy of trustworthiness, which again goes back to abundance. And so I think ultimately reconnecting to nature is, is certainly the best way that I reconnected to the conscious living vibration of what abundance is and means in the universe because money is just one little tiny part of that. But abundance is this alive frequency. Mm -hmm. And when you are operating in faith, when you are letting your doubt be present without shaming, blaming, hating, wronging it, you're operating in abundance. Yeah, It's like everything's welcome here and I'm safe even with this doubt. I'm solid. I'm good. Even when I have this doubt, oh, I can lovingly and compassionately accept you Mm. because of how abundant I am. And then that is like real empress, queen energy. Mm -hmm. Queen is not trying to like rule over anyone. It's like, no, I'm, I'm good. Like I'm so solid and confident within myself that like no one can take anything away from me. And that's the new world of abundance that I do hope and think is is emerging. And we have to be able to tend to the parts of us that feel scarcity or feel fear or, you know, feel anxiety with the loving vibration of abundance. Mm-hmm. And that's what will then alchemize and transform them and allow us to then wield more abundance in all of its different forms, in community, in connection. And we were like trading codes before this conversation. It's like, that's abundance. Yeah, Doesn't have to be money all the time, right? There's so many ways to exchange. But when you can exchange within your body with the parts of you that feel scarcity in a loving, abundant way, Mm -hmm. everything changes. Mm. Yeah, so good. And it's been so true in my own life and my own repatterning of and reparenting of those parts and with love and with compassion and and for anyone listening to this, what helped me in my own life and what I'm hearing you say too is just like the willingness to be quiet enough to listen to the answer come through and then to rebuild that relationship through trusting, following it. And like that, that's that been so huge for me in my life as well. And I'm going to take a hard left here. but <laughs> And on the kind of topic of connecting with yourself, though, mm-hmm. and something that I saw that you talked about, and it's very resonant in my own life right now, um, was your three years of celibacy. And I... Oh, good. I haven't gotten this one yet. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is alive for me because I have done a year of celibacy. And it wasn't this thing where I was like, oh, I'm going to do a year. <laughs> yeah. It just has happened that way. And... It's a beautiful segue in from trusting yourself and connecting to yourself because that's the path that I've been on and I would imagine what what you went on as well in those three years. And so I would love to talk a little bit about your path through celibacy and I now know you've attracted your your partner as well through that. But what was that experience like? What led you to that? Let's jam on it. Oh, love that. Okay, great. Yeah, I've never talked about this. This is good because my audience is really yearning for these uh, answers and questions. Perfect, so, great. So bless. Yeah, for me, it was, and this is an interesting perspective and segue, it actually isn't as hard of a left as we may think because it's about the energy of abundance. Mm. People might think, oh, you know, you're in scarcity. It was like, no, I'm in abundance. Like, I don't need anything from anyone. I don't want anyone coming in here and like dragging down my energy. You know, when you're like in a interaction with someone where you're playing games, how much of your mental and emotional and some often physical energy is tied up in it and thinking about them and having these like Mm -hmm. fake conversations with them and worried, are they going to text me? And like, oh, they haven't texted me. And oh, okay. Like, should I wait three hours to respond? Like, oh my goddess, we have so much better and more important things to spend our energy on. And so for me, I made a couple of mistakes. Mm, um, I made a few <laughs> wrong choices. <laughs> and um, I actually, nobody knows this, but I, I'll share it here because it feels relevant. I joined a thruple 
Mm. And I became like a mistress. And like the wife was the one doing the whole thing. She was like the ringleader and the orchestrator of it all. But after a very short period of time, I was like, what in the fuck am I doing? Like, I am the queen. I am not, this is not, I do not need anyone in my life with this amount of processing yeah. and like all of, like, I'm not available for this. <laughs> and I realized like, wow, I'm, and the thruple was actually a rebound from an even worse decision, but I was like, okay, I'm going to take, again, this energy of abundance within myself. Like I value who I am. I want to heal and transform. And I, like we were talking about just now with the beliefs, I want to shift whatever these beliefs are that have attracted these people into my life, these types of situations where, where like, I am not operating where I want to be. That's my responsibility. That has nothing to do with those people. Like, I let them into my life. I chose that. I said yes. I stayed for whatever period of time I stayed for. That's on me. So I want to work on this. Like, I want to transform whatever scarcity is in my field that's making me think that this is enough. Like, this is offering me enough to, to give my energy and my heart and my pussy and my body to. Like, hard no. So I assumed it would be like three months, six mm -hmm. months, you know? Like, yeah. okay. And then I'll meet someone and I'll have another little thing. And instead, I realized I don't want to settle. Mm -hmm. And that's the most common thing that you get is like, just settle. And they're not saying that. They would never mm -hmm. use that word. They're like, oh, just give him a chance. Mm -hmm. Like, just try the dating apps. Like, girl, you got to get out there. Like, it's been so long. Like, why? Mm -hmm. Why Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to give my body to someone that I don't feel in resonance with or who's going to cherish and worship me the way that I desire? Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? That's not fucking spiritual to me, yeah. right? Like, if you're having casual sex in a, in a way that is like, consciously, I'm going to worship my body and I'm going to exist with this person and I'm going to open and like, that's how you touch God— fuck yeah, like go for it. I'm here for that all day. I'm not that kind of person. Like I can't have casual sex with someone random. I'm just like not into it. I've never had a one night stand. I did think that my one night stand um, was gonna be a one night stand and here we are four years later. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, didn't work for me. But what I did during that time was this work. Yeah. I worked on my beliefs. I worked on my relationship to money. I worked on, I was deep in Tantra. I was like very, all the somatic healing, lots of sex magic, lots of group pleasure rituals with my sister. So sisters, so where everyone's in a circle and we're all masturbating and pleasuring ourselves together, but with either our own individual intentions or like for someone to get a book deal or like for someone's birthday or whatever. And it was all, there was no touching. It was not orgiastic except for individually within yourself. But I learned about my body. I learned what my pussy wanted. I learned what my heart needed to open. I learned so much about my own darkness and my own shadows and all of the stories about like, oh, should I just settle? And should I go into these scarcity programs of like, oh, I'm not enough as I am, or I need someone to complete me, or if I don't have a partner, I'm not valuable. Just all these stories that especially I think women get programmed to believe. And that's how I spent my time. Yeah, I was so devoted. Uh, my spiritual practice was like eight hours long. You know, mm -hmm. it was like all day, every day. That's all I was yeah. doing. And I was very broke during that time. And it was because I was unwilling to do anything that didn't make me feel good. Like, I wanted to be myself. I wanted to get paid to be myself. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to settle anywhere. I'm going to operate in this state of abundance in terms of trust. And I said this recently to someone that like, before I had the money to spend the way I want, I spent my time the way I wanted. It's like, what do I want to do? I want to meditate. I want to have a pleasure practice. I want to, you know, go on this trip. And so I would like set the intention with the universe. And somehow these miracles would occur. Like I'd had no money and I went to Sedona and I ended up staying there for like almost two weeks and still didn't end up spending any money. I actually like left with more money than I had on the, it's just mm. miracles would occur because of my faith and my trust and my devotion to the frequency of abundance specifically around myself as a being who was whole and complete without needing someone to penetrate me in order to like feel cool or yeah. whatever. And so I also learned so much about how pleasure 
and sexuality are linked with abundance. Yeah. And so that was really what the, that period of time for me was. It was like money and love. You know, like those were the things I was working on. Mm-hmm. And after these long, almost three years, I was like, okay, I'm ready. I've figured out the money thing. I've made money. Now I want to do the partnership thing. And because I did want, I think that that's an important thing for people with with celibacy, with partnership is like looking at what I really did was working with my own inner masculine. Mm-hmm. So I'm, att- I was attracting a masculine partner, a, you know, male, alpha male identified partner. So I was like, what's my inner alpha male like? Is he empowered? Is he driven? Are we doing this stuff? Like, is he motivated? I was so heavily in my feminine that actually at a certain point I got a blood test and my body was not even producing testosterone. Like nothing, Wow. nothing. So that was a huge wake up call for me of like, oh wow, I need to reconnect with my inner masculine. I need to figure out who the protect- protector and provider is inside of me. Yeah. And so I really started cultivating that and there was a couple of things. I was like living in my friend's guest room. I just lived in her guest room, beautiful house. Sometimes I paid rent. Sometimes I didn't because I didn't have the money and she didn't need it. So she didn't really care. But like, I didn't have a home to welcome someone into. I was like living in my girlfriend's house. So that was a big piece for me. And finally, once I had the money, I was like, okay, I'm going to get a palace. And I got like a massive four bedroom house for myself. I'd never, Mm -hmm. I'd never even had money to spend like that. And I got this house and I was like, this is going to be my place. And I'm like welcoming this person in. And I decorated it all for love and money. I had like a feng shui consultant come over and Mm. she dialed in the whole space energetically for, you know, things like circular couches and like this color here. And how about we do a specific, I got a custom made bed that was, had cubbies for a crystal grid, like all these magical things that I did. And then ultimately a month after I moved into that house, I met Bear, my partner. And it was because I had eradicated the parts of myself that were running from the empowered masculine. So I'd built some structures. I'd built some systems. I had a a container for my feminine energy to flow. I'd accessed abundance. I'd worked through enough scarcity in my life to be able to be making money. At that time, I was like, I'd like hit the six figure mark, but I wasn't making like a ton of money. I was making like a couple hundred grand, which was great and amazing. And like, awesome from being totally broke and making like $5,000 a year. So that was, it was wonderful. But I also had come into a really profound balance within myself. Mm -hmm. And I had found what it looked like to be the protector of my sacred feminine energy and of my womb and my portal and my pussy and my pleasure. And I had found what pleasure, and again, like these, all these different codes and parts of abundance, I had just devoted so much to pleasure. Not of like, oh, I don't do anything that's hard. It's like, no, sometimes the pleasure came through like deep pain and de-armoring within myself and like going through all of the shitty things that I believed about myself or that I, you know, hoped wouldn't be true or that I was so afraid of. And I, I touched all of those things and I would bring pleasure to those things and create safety for those parts of myself. And that's ultimately what then allowed me to, yeah, be met by a person, one of my mantras during that time was like, if I exist, he exists. Mm. I exist. I am a wild, feral, abundant, successful, witchy ass woman. Like there's a counterpart to me Mm. somewhere. And he's so different than I expected. He is not at all who I envisioned. He's super galactic and like very futuristic. Like I'm ancient, he's future. I was expecting like, you know, very like rugged mountain man, you know, and like my man is a businessman. That's Mm. how he is. And so it was very different, but he's such an expression of what I was cultivating within myself. And I still get to bring all the the wild nature of who I am to our partnership. And it was such a deep process, but I, I would never, ever tell anyone to settle. I'm like, no, girl, you hold out. That doesn't mean don't work on the stuff. Like, There's a difference. That's, I think, one of the things that I see with clients and women wanting to manifest partnership is that they're like, oh, well, it's been five years that I'm holding out. And like, where is he? Mm -hmm. And that that texture, that vibration of like harumph or like, uh, like entitlement, like I she should have already been here. That's a thing that you get to work on and work through so that you are so when I met Bear, I was we were at a retreat and I was just like, 
I didn't wear a stitch of makeup the entire weekend. I was just in my witch hat and like sexy black dresses and no makeup the entire week that we met at this retreat at our friend Daniel's retreat. Mm. And I was just myself. I felt whole. I felt complete. I felt good. I didn't need anyone. I didn't need anything. I was like, I'm successful. I'm empowered. I like myself. I think I'm cool. I, I have like gotten to the place where like other people's opinions don't affect me. And that took so much work. But then it was easy to magnetize someone. And so for me, that work took three years, I guess. You know, yeah. it was hard. It was a lot of work. It was so worth it. And I I just always encourage people to never settle. Like, it's okay that, you know, that is one thing. Bear, he's like, it's never enough with you. And I'm like, yeah, that's how I got here. Because mm. I believe in magic. And I'm going to keep believing that more magic is always possible in every moment. And that's how I've continued to get all of the beautiful mm. manifestations in my life. Mm. So don't settle. Like It's worth the wait, but do the work. Oh. <laughs> uh. That's so good. It's so good. And as you're talking, I'm just so feeling into my own journey and see so much of myself in that journey and the space that I'm in currently. And um, yeah, the reclamation of my own power and and the balance and harmonizing of the inner masculine and the inner feminine and something that was coming through for me to share um, with those listening to this is for me, what I learned is uh, our culture often emasculates men, right? So we we need the balance of the feminine and the masculine. And this whole feminism culture like moved us into this swing in the opposite direction. It's like we actually need um, both energies so deeply empowered and empowered in ourselves individually. And I learned that I was emasculating my own inner masculine. And when I learned by, by telling myself I wasn't doing good enough, why am I Oof. not doing the thing? Why? And, and I got really into feminine flow and I hadn't had structure in my life. And, I, and then I was beating myself up over the why the heck can I not do, you know, like Whoa. all the things. And when I learned that I was emasculating my inner masculine, I Whoa. was like, no fucking wonder. Like this is wild. So I, I began to really appreciate and love and respect that part of me and ask that part of me to come online. Wow. And that is what has begun to create my own abundance and my yeah. own, and have the container and the house. And, and it's so crazy when you when you begin to get to that point and talking, um, you talking about your house and moving in and having the flow of the energy and having this container to hold you. That's what I feel like this is. And I yeah. moved in three weeks ago. Wow. And so just the alignment in that and the the work that you had to do to get there, I just have such deep respect and adoration. And I know what that takes. And we were talking about this before the we started filming just around where I've been in my own yeah. um, process of going really deep into my own somatic work. And I, I still feel the truth of me being on that journey currently. For sure. You know, it never stops. It, it never does stop. Um, but I just have such deep deep respect for the journey that you've been on and the magic that you've created in your life and what mm. it is that you stand for and how mm. you can be a pillar of light for mm. for people uh creating magic and ushering that in in their own in their own lives so thank you so much oh my pleasure for, yeah being here this was so much fun and yeah. um just and incredible. thanks for just blowing my mind right now with that like the way that we internalize the patriarchal punitive like we've changed the sex of god yeah god used to be the goddess it was all matriarchal and we've mm. changed the church changed God to this patriarchal, punitive, like bad God. And when we make that the masculine within ourselves and make ourselves wrong for not like doing enough, mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, I'm spinning on that one. I'm oh. like, whoa, yes, so okay. Good. I'm emasculating my inner masculine. Okay, yeah. yeah, wild. Wild. I know that's when I first discovered that, I was, I had to sit with that for a minute <laughs> and many days. I'm still sitting yeah, with it. Yeah, my my yeah. eyes are like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Let that marinate. Let yeah. that one marinate. It's just, so beautiful. And and I just am such a stand for people getting paid for who they are and bringing their gifts to the world and creating magic and living in this Harry Potter land. And that's something <laughs> that I've so learned over the past year. I'm like, we don't live where we think we live. And, and more and more people are waking up to that and yeah. the energy and the power that we truly have to create a beautiful, massive abundance in our lives and for the planet. Yeah. So thank you. Hallelujah. My yes. pleasure. Thanks, sis. Uh, 
Well, I know you have a book coming out. I do. And I want everyone to find you and to buy your book. Isn't it January? Comes yes, out? Okay. January 30th. Beautiful. It's called Tell Intuition. Us. It Great. is an exploration of the law of correspondence mm-hmm. of as above, so below. How we can utilize, like color magic was a huge way that I worked in my home to generate abundance mm-hmm. and working with the archetypes of the Zodiac and all of the numbers. And there's just so, to me, everything is information and everything is divination. So Mm -hmm. everything in our lives has this greater significance that we can read through like that first invitation of the elements. And so the book is really an exploration of how we can work with these elements, how we can use different rituals in our lives and different ways of connecting to the world around us and the magic within us to empower ourselves, to heal, to make our dreams come true, and ultimately to make a magical world for everyone to live in. And yeah, it's it's been such a gift. It's a really beautiful creation. I read the audiobook myself with my cat sitting on my lap, so that was really fun. And yeah, it's out in January wherever books are sold and is going to change the lives of everyone who reads it. You will see your life and the universe in a different way and really understand how to communicate with it in its ancient, symbolic, primordial language that's so far beyond English or Spanish or any any language that we understand now. It's it's really so much deeper than that, and it's communicating with us in every moment. Mm. And so intuition is a, a really great guidance and, and guideline for how to respond and communicate in return. Oh, beautiful. And by the time this releases, it might be out, actually. So we'll put the link in in the show notes if it's It's out. (laughs) It's out now. Go get it. Yeah, great. Yeah. (laughs) Beautiful. And where can everyone find you, connect with you? Everything is Mia Magic, M-I-A-M-A-G-I-K. So my Instagram, YouTube, website, Mia Magic with a K, M-I-A-M-A-G-I-K. So all the things are there. It will be linked in the show notes for all of you guys. And Mia, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your magic with us and helping to create a more magical world. Thanks so much for having me, babe. Mm, Yep. So fucking spiritual. So fucking spiritual and so much fucking fun. As always, you guys, please share this with a friend that needs to hear it. We want to share more magic with the world. And, you know, if you're feeling like you really want to love on us, uh, leave us a review and, and share this on social media as well. I love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, keep it fucking spiritual. Thank you for listening to the It's Fucking Spiritual podcast. I am so glad that you're here. And if this episode resonated with you, I invite you to share this with a friend that you feel needs to hear it. And if you are really feeling the love and support for this show, this podcast thrives off of your listens and your reviews. So I would love if you could leave us an honest review. We would love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your questions, and it helps us get this podcast in the hands of more people and would mean so much to me to receive your support. So thank you.